Hey, this is Beth. Listen, what we live for at Living Proof is to serve people the Word of God. We base our ministry on Hebrews 4.12 that tells us that the Word is alive and active. We pray this message is going to serve you in some way today and that God is going to speak through it. Thank you so much for giving us this privilege. We want to come before you with everything that we have, with everything that we are, Lord, with our soul, our, our mind, our strength, our full heart, God. We want to engage with you because we believe, Lord, we have confidence in your word that you are sending forth scripture to accomplish a certain work in each one of us. And Father, we ask you, take the lid off the milk. We ask you, Father, that you would pour it out on us, that you would not let us um, in any way be distracted from you, uh, be an obstacle to you, uh, get down in deep where we are concerned and show us uh, your great affection for us, uh, your great worthiness to be praised. I pray, God, that you would bond anything about um, quirky about me and weird about me that keeps people from being able to receive of your word. Bind my flesh, Lord, and loose your spirit. And I, I ask that not just for me. I, I want it for all of them. What would happen, Lord, if, if all 180,000 of us were like filled to the brim with your spirit? And when your word, the fire of your word came to us, it would just like set like a, a torch to the flammable oil of your Holy Spirit. And we would just like combust in your great name. I want that. I want you. You are my only hope. You are the only good that dwells in me. Lord, I confess before these with great joy that I have been in the deepest possible pit and you have pulled me out. I'm not the woman that I used to be, Lord. I'm not the woman that I used to be. And I give you full credit for that. I'm, I'm not the woman I want to be either, Lord. Come, do something today. Do something today in me that causes me to look a lot more like you when the end of this day comes, and I pray it for them as well. Now, your glory be done. Come pursue us, Lord. You, you come to chase us down. We're going to stand still so you can catch us in the miraculous, beautiful, saving, redeeming, loving name of Jesus. And for his sake, amen. You may be seated. Praise you, Lord. Would you turn with me to Luke 1, 1 through 4? Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Now, you and I, over the courses of our three sessions together, two longer sessions, and our last one will be just about a half an hour, you and I really are going to explore these four verses, but we're going to come back and forth and back and forth and back to, and forth to them. But, but more than exploring this particular portion by itself, you and I are also going to look into the life that Christ Jesus ordained to pin them. Because I, I have been so fascinated by this man named Luke recently in my studies, and, and, and I began to know a couple of weeks ago that I was being fascinated by it because God was working it toward this particular gathering. Now, here's what Blonder Than She Pays to Be is about to do, and this is always a dangerous thing. I'm going to try to show you, I'm going to try to give you the segue of what it was that made me so fascinated all of a sudden with Luke. Is that fair? So just go with me and see this tie together, if you would. Leave something here in Luke 1 because this will be our primary text. Go with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. I've been in 2 Timothy a ton here lately and done some memory work out of this book. And so something began to jump off the page at me. We're going to look at two different portions of it. Go with me to 2 Timothy. First, you're going to chapter 2. And verse 22, look at these words. There's a little phrase I especially want you to lock into. It says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, 
love and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I want to read that part again. Pursue righteousness, faith. I love these four things. Righteousness, we, we have a, uh, we're, we're called to live obedient lives, to live rightly. Faith, we're called to be women of, of tremendous faith. Love, we're called to love one another. And peace, a shalom kind of peace. Peace like a river, but a peace, a, a settled heart before our God, along with those who call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, I memorized it in the New English translation, and I want you to hear it out of that translation. It says this, pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love, and peace in company with others who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Everybody say, in company with others. <laughs> say it one more time, and I, I can't hear you on the other side of the screen. Say it one more time. In company with others. In company with others. We were called to pursue Christ in company with others who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. We're going to get back to that in just a moment. So I thought it was so tender that, that of, of all people that God would call, He called Paul to show us, to demonstrate to us what it looks like to walk the thing out in company with others. So keep that little part in mind. Now go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. So that was already really getting me. I thought that was a really beautiful thing, that in company with others who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And then 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 12. 2 Timothy 4. Uh, Paul is writing this to Timothy. And in fact, it is the very last of Paul's letters that he will ever write. When he ends the words in 2 Timothy 4, his pen runs dry, and it is a very little time until he gives his neck to the sword. So he knows it's coming. He's already told Timothy, listen, you got to do the thing because the time for me to depart is right here at hand. I mean, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And, and now, listen, i got to Give this torch to the others among you who are competent to teach. And you've got to do the thing that God has called you to do. But, but he says this. I want to pick up in verse 9. He's so Paul is saying to Timothy, because, he, because he's hoping to see him before he's martyred. And he says, do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. I want you to stop there for just a moment. Let me tell you something. You remember when I was saying that a number of the women in the blog community had written just that one overriding condition in their lives right now? What's the biggest thing going on in your life right now? And, and one of you said, I have such abandonment issues that I can barely live through it. And I just thought to myself, I, I pray that you're going to see, you talk about abandonment. This one's left me, this one's left me, this one's left me. He knew what it felt like to have a very dear friend. We're going to see other places where the name Demas comes up in a very loving context. This was a very good friend. Anybody in this audience ever been betrayed by a good friend? Paul got that. He understood that. And it says this, and I'm picking back up now, and oh, i, I got to have it in the context, so let me pack up. Nine, do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he has loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I've sent to Caicus to Ephesus. And when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. And then he goes on to speak about how he came to a place where everyone deserted him. But I want you to lock on into those words, those five words, only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. You know, something that's even more tender about it is that probably because um, Paul, especially in the later years, had someone else that would pen, take the, the um, dictation from him and write the letter for him. Since only Luke is with him, you can be pretty certain that Luke is the one taking this down on the scroll. So I want you to imagine with me that he's telling him, he's giving him all this dictation, and here's Luke, he's taking it down, looking up at him, looking back down, looking up at him, 
looking back down, and he comes to the place where he says, Demas has deserted me. He went, to, he went on to Thessalonica. Um, Crescens went to um, Ga Galatia, and Titus went to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. I, I just wonder. I wonder if Luke paused at all. I wonder if knowing that Paul had just said a couple of verses above, the time for me to depart is at hand, and Luke knew that it was. I wonder how emotional those words might have been. I wonder if his hand quivered just a bit. I wonder if his eyes filled with tears, because I, I want you to just behold on the pages of 2 Timothy chapter 4, you are looking at Paul's BFF, no doubt. Luke is his very, very, very best friend. When all had departed, only Luke is with me. One of you um, replied back in a tweet. I was going to say one of you tweeted yesterday. Isn't it interesting what that could say in 20 years if someone is watching this and no one knows what Twitter is anymore? I mean, what, what if that happened? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I always say it's a funny thing. To say. Imagine that 10 years ago we would have said someone tweeted me. What on earth would we have thought they meant? But someone replied um, back to me when I said that uh, I was heading your direction. Someone replied back to me and said, I am going to be in the Lubbock group tomorrow, and I am bringing my best friend and my other friends. <laughs> and I don't know why it hit me so funny, but I just want you, if you've come with a small group, you may or may not be the best friend. <laughs> Is that fair? Because, you know, like kind of like try to really see if you can sense anything today because it's going to now make all of you suspects of one another and it's going to be the person that brought all of you so she's the main one to watch but I need you to know only one of you is her BFF and I don't know if you know which one right now all of you are thinking it's you but perhaps over lunch you'll be able to figure it out and I don't know how that will go before the day is over, but it just, it made me so happy. It just made me so happy. Okay, so only Luke is with me. Now, who in the world was Luke? Look with me now at the book of Colossians. Now, listen, sisters, if you need to look at the front of your Bible, your table of context is, uh, tense is one of the most wonderful pages in your entire scriptures. Look at it, figure out where the books are, and try to go with me uh, to Colossians. Sometimes when I'm up in front of a group, the Lord will hide the books in my Bible. I think he gets a kick out of it. I think he thinks he's funny sometimes. And sometimes I've got a verse written down that is nowhere on the page that I've gone to, and then I have to make something up again. And it's just, it's just an ugly sight, an ugly sight. Now, I know that you're going to wish that you were saying all these names with me um, as I read this to you, but um, just, just let, let your ears go there with me. Colossians 4, 10 through 14. Colossians 4, 10 through 14. It says this, My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. That would be John Mark. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. I, I, I love Paul so much. I love the way that he would write a letter and say, someone is coming to see you. I trust you to receive them joyfully, and I'm coming right after they do, and I'll be checking with you about it. I mean, he, he just was bold, bold. I'm sending someone to you treat him well, have hospitality toward him. And it says in verse 11, Jesus, of course, and this is, uh, that was a common uh, name um, at that time, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews, uh, so these are, these that he, he's already named, uh, Mark, Aristarchus, uh, Barnabas, and then um, Justice. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, so we know Epaphras is going to be a Gentile, because the only Jews that were with him, he's already named. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and those in Laodicea and Heropolis. Our dear friend, here's where we go, verse 14, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas, here he is, just so close to demon, isn't it? 
Just so, and I'm just, I'm just kidding. That really wasn't. And our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas sends greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and Nympha and the church in her house. Our dear friend Luke. Now, this is where I like so many of the other translations a lot better because very often the NIV, I've got the 84 NIV here, and very often it will um, use, it will say friend instead of beloved. But the word in the original is to love them, to love them. And some of the uh, translations say, the HICSP says this, Luke, the dearly loved physician. Now, this is how we know that Luke is a doctor. It's from this verse right here. He is a man of means. He is a man of much education and probably a man of an urban background. And it just puts a whole new spin on, I just love my doctor. I mean, doesn't it? I mean, like, how many of you like just like, you loved your doctor? Anybody? Like, I love my doctor. But when was the last time you went to your doctor and he said, you know what? I just feel so strongly about you. I'm just going to go on home with you right now. <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm going to leave everything behind and I'm just going to attend to you. Puts a whole new perspective on a beloved doctor. Now, I want to show you where he shows up, Luke, the beloved physician, where he shows up in the book of Acts. And I'm hoping so much this translates on the other side of the screen. I don't always know, and it's a terrible thing to find out that, that I, I really um, had misthought it when I'm up here in the middle of teaching with a lot of people and, and they don't think it's cool, but I'm hoping that you're going to. I, I love this kind of thing. So I want you to see, turn with me to the book of Acts and go with me to Acts chapter 16, and I want to show you where he suddenly shows up on the page. The book of Acts chapter 16, we're going to pick up at verse 6. Acts chapter 16, verse 6. It says this, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. I just think this kind of thing is so fascinating. I want to ask, how did they know? What was it about the Holy Spirit that kept them out? What did he use? Those things just fascinate me. It says in verse 7, when they, are you seeing the they? Are you seeing all these days? When they, everybody say when they. Yes. Say it one more time. Yes. When they came to the border of Mycia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, what is that next word? Tell me again. We got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called who? To preach the gospel to? In verse 11, from Troas, what does it say? Say it really loud so they can hear you. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis. And from there, what does it say? Traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony in the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and what? stayed there several days. And on the Sabbath, what? Please. Went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. What does it say next? Please. Sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. We're hoping this very little we right here on this page will speak to we women who are gathered all over the place today as well. It goes from they, 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 they. There is no fanfare. There is no announcement. There's no trumpet blast. Absolutely nothing to convey that it's coming. Just suddenly it goes from they, after all of this account and narrative, through the first 15 chapters of Acts, suddenly we go from they, 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 they to what? We, 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 we. And so somewhere between the they in verse 8 and the we in verse 10, here comes Luke and joins them. I mean, listen, you would think he would at least put his name down in it. But, but we see, all we see is this transition, and unless we're looking for it, it goes completely, would you agree, without notice. 
to suddenly we've gone from they to we. It would take us maybe chapters to even wake up to the fact that, okay, whoever's writing it is also in the middle of experiencing it. Now, what caused Luke to suddenly come into the picture? Now, now here's what we know um, from traditional historical writings. Now, they're not, some of the ones I'm going to refer to today are not, they're not scripture, but they're written by historians uh, from the early Christian era. So, we can put some confidence. It's not, it's not inerrant. It's not um, something that we can count on 100%, but we can, we can look to them and think, now, why would they have just made up where he was from? Traditional historians from the early church era tell us that Luke and Paul met in Antioch, When uh, Paul first went to Antioch, Antioch is a really uh, neat, neat place for us because we're told in Scripture, it was the first place, that we were ever referred to as Christians. And by the way, that's little Christ. And by the way, it was labeled us as an insult and not as a compliment. And they just went like, yeah, I mean, we'll take it. We want to be Christ-like. That's what we're called for. So they, they meet up in Antioch. So we're assuming that Antioch is Luke's home, his hometown, and where he served as a physician. So they met somewhere along the way, and they're thinking, since Paul was there in around um, A.D. 43, that probably that was the point that Paul met him. Now, years go by from that time to the time that we're picking up on right now. Now, I want you to see something, because what is the question on the table? Why did Luke suddenly come into the life of Paul? I want you to see something with me. In fact, get two places in your hands. Get, turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. Oh, Lord, cause everybody to really like this. I just think this kind of thing is so fun. Galatians 4. And you're still going to look back at Acts 16, and I'm going to show you something in verse 6. Okay, everybody got it? So you've got your Galatians 4. Now look back, holding on to Galatians 4, look back and get a hold of Acts 16, verse 6. It says, Paul and his companions traveled. Now remember our context. We're right at the place where it's about to go from they to we. Is everybody straight on that one? All right, so it says in Acts 16, verse 6, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phraea and Galatia. What does it say? And where? I want everybody to say it really loud. And where? Phraea and where? Galatia, Galatia, having been kept from the Holy, by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. So, okay, what we know is that they have been in Galatia, and it's been they in Galatia, and then suddenly in Troas, it becomes, what's the word? We. Now, holding on to that, look with me in Galatians chapter 4. I just think this is so fun. Galatians 4 verse 12, this is Paul writing, and he says this. I think I'll start at verse 13, verse 13, 413. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Now, who is he talking to? What what book are we in? Where had he been in Acts chapter 16? I said, you will remember that it was because of a what? An illness that I first preached the gospel to you, Paul says. Even though my illness was a trial to you, in other words, it must have been a big enough deal that a, like, a lot of people knew about it, and it was, uh, it was something that caused um, uh, quite a lot of stir. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. And what has happened to your joy? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. All right, listen carefully because somehow something happened in the life of Paul while he was in Galatia that, he, that caused him to be there in a very sick and weakened condition condition, something bad enough that since he says you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me, somehow the illness took such effect that it had to have also affected his eyes and his vision. Now, we have no idea what that would have been, but what I want you to understand is that right after that point, Luke joins him on the road. If you're just, if you're stepping in this with me, I want to see your sweet little hand. See, you get this with me? You and I are trying to figure out why did it go from what? They to what? What happened there? 
because there's no introduction of him on the picture except that we find out from Galatians that Paul says, when I came to you, I came to you ill. And I mean ill enough to draw quite a lot of focus from him. He said, you'll remember it well. And so somehow, word was given back to Luke, the condition that, that P Paul was in, and here comes Luke, and off and on, more on than off, he joins him, except for some times, like he'll stay back in Philippi for a short time, but for the most part, from this point on, they are this close, and he goes almost everywhere on these missionary journeys with Paul and is with him all the way to his death. So in all likelihood, that is exactly the point that he came in to the picture right there when he was sick. It says um, in, in uh, the Bible um, encyclopedias that he probably began to assist him. He got to know him a little bit in 43, probably around 52 and 53, and then on, off and on for the rest of his life. And so this is what we know. He accompanied Paul, but he didn't just accompany Paul. He put the company back in a company. Anybody get that with me? He, he put the company back in the company. There's, a, there's a kind of a, a little um, saying that is used today in our very virtual culture that I love as much as you do. I mean, I, I, I can hardly do without my iPhone either. I mean, I've always got something going. I, I, I just, I, I love it too. But, but there's this, this little phrase that is called alone together. That means that even though in our virtual society we have so allowed our virtual relationships to overtake the ones that happen face to face, that we'll even go out to eat. I ask you, when was the last time you went to a restaurant and watched somebody at a different table and like at least two of them were on their telephone? I mean, at least two of them. And I mean, they're doing all this, doing all this, and nobody's talking to one another. But Luke put the company back in a company. How do I know that? Well, because Paul called them to walk with one another in company with those who called upon God from a pure heart. And his company, by the time he got to Timothy chapter 4, only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. Right then, he had one person who was with him. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You and I are going to compile seven statements based on the life and some of the writings of this man, this beloved physician named Luke. And the first one is this. We were created for good company. You and I were created by God for good company. Would you take a moment and write that down if you are a note taker? We need it, we want it, we can't flourish without it. We gotta have a, some, somebody say, I gotta have me some good company. I gotta have me some good company. We were made for it. And the more we cut ourselves off from it, and listen, we can have lots and lots of fun with people out there, but let me tell you, we gotta have some people in our lives that bring us some, what are our two key words? We gotta have some good company. We got to have some good company. And if we want good company, we got to learn how to be good company. Now, notice that it said that Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 the good company of those who call upon the Lord from a what? From a what? From a pure heart. If we want to know what we could do for one another in this culture that we live in, in such an age of seduction, in such an age of addiction, in such an age of, uh, of skewed um, uh, narcissistic relationships, if we want to know one of the biggest favors we can do for one another as we bring ourselves good company between ourselves, it is to have a pure heart in our relationships. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I want you to hear, I think that I can just read it to you. But let, you might want to jot it down. 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, verse 22, that says this, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, and lo love for our sisters, 
Love one another deeply from the heart. Listen to it again. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying what the, the uh, verse that um, I'm most familiar with is out of the NET, uh, by obedience to the truth. Now that you've purified your soul by obedience to, um, to the truth. So that, in other words, you've been obedient so that you can love one another with sincere mutual affection. So love one another deeply from a pure heart. Now, I want to tell you something. I've I've let this roll over and over and over in my mind coming up to today. Um, When we think about this call to our pure hearts and we think about what role obedience has in it, you and I know from 1 John 1, 9 that the moment we sincerely confess our sins to God, we are forgiven. In fact, we're told in the Scriptures that we are completely purified. I mean, we are purified from all our transgressions as we make confession before God. So if it's a little confusing, how do we purify our souls? Isn't God the only one that can purify our souls? Absolutely. That's good sound theology. But what Peter is talking about in 2 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, 22, what he's talking about is that what will happen if you and I do not surrender ourselves to walk in obedience to God? And by that, I don't just want to throw out a big theological word. It just means to walk in His way. To walk in His way. Until we do that, then we just keep making confession over and over again and falling back into the same sin. Confession, fall back into the same sin. And we're all in the cycle of just um, uh, con- confession. And then we walk right back into destruction. Confession, destruction, confession, destruction, confession, destruction. We just keep doing the th- same thing over and over again. Would anybody just kind of like a change? Anybody, would anybody like to like, break out of the cycle? Anybody just like keep going back into the same thing? I keep saying I'm sorry over and over again. I keep doing the same thing over and over again. Where does it stop? Well, there's got to be a point at which we just surrender ourselves. Lord, I'm just going to do it your way. I'm going to do what you said. I mean, it's this really revolutionary concept. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to just look at the Word. I'm going to actually try it. And then something miraculous begins to happen. And what some words that God gave me that I jotted down in my notes was that disobedience to God deforms the heart. I want you to think that through and see if you think that's so. That when we walk in disobedience, even when we're in Christ, but we're walking in disobedience to Him, that, that it deforms our hearts. And what 1 Peter 1, would suggest to us is that obedience to God reforms the heart. Is that making any sense to anybody? So try that with me so we can see if we're kind of tracking on the same uh, plane here today. Disobedience to God does what to the heart? It deforms the heart. And obedience to God does what? It, it reforms the heart. And, and this will help us understand that when you and I are looking for the people that we want to walk in closest soul fellowship to. Anybody? Like we have a lot of friends. We're even told to love our enemies. So we know we're supposed to be out there with people. But when it comes to those with whom we have closest fellowship, we need to know up front that those who are walking in obedience have, have got souls that have been purified into a more... Um, Um, life active hot pavement life on planet earth we know that they've got this like real life practical a purification of their souls going and we can kind of trust their walk and relationship with us a little bit better is that making sense to anybody I can also know like if I've got a really close loved one that's totally like just wigged out in disobedience to God what I'm going to know is that I love them so much but I'm going to have Philippians 1, 9, and 10, kind of love for them. I'm going to love them with insight and knowledge. In other words, I'm not going to have blind love for them because I'm already going to know that since they are walking in disobedience to God, I probably cannot completely trust their hearts. Is anybody getting that with me? What if we could discern that back and forth? See, I, not everybody I love and not everybody they love, I've been the person with the impure heart. I've been the idiot. I've been the unhealthy person in the relationship. Is anybody else besides me? I've been that person. I've been the person you should be scared of. I've been that person. We've all had unhealthy relationships. But what if we begin to bring a pure heart to the mix? And we do that by just walking. Lord, I just want, I want to do what you say. I want to walk in your way. 
And, and what if we realized up front that there may be a whole lot of people we love, but we don't necessarily entrust ourselves to them when they're completely walking in disobedience to God. We got to guard some of those relationships. And again, we still love. One, one of the things that I have I've tried to I counsel some of the young women in my life that I get to really hands on a mentor is that very, very often God calls us to minister to people, even mentor people that, um, that may be tremendously emotionally unhealthy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and we're called to it. We're called to it because we've been her. If you're not her right now, I mean, if I were a betting woman, you've been her. I've been her. And so we, that's, that's part of our calling. But one of the things I think will help us in that situation is if you know you've got a really unhealthy person, then get a small group going. One-on-one, -on -one, listen, one-on-one -on -one with a tremendously unhealthy person will turn you inside out. You will get in the biggest entanglement of your life, in the biggest codependent mess you have ever run into in your life. Can anybody testify to that? I know some of you can because I've heard from some of you because some of you said it when you wrote in on the blog. Just unhealthy relationships. Many of you said, I just want, I just need some emotional healing. And it's so much better when we're in a framework where we're going to minister to people that are, um, that are, that may be pretty wigged out in sin, so worthy of loving, and God has called us to him, then maybe we do it in a small group context where there's somebody else in the group holding us all accountable, loving one another from a pure heart, loving one another from a pure heart. What was number one? We were what? We were created for what? We were created for good company. We need it. I hear from so many people now that we've gone so virtual in our relationships. They're constantly people tell me, I'm just so lonely. I don't have a good friend. I don't have a group of good friends. Pray for that. Pray for that. God would put us back into a framework of good company because number one is this, we were created for good company. Now turn back to Acts chapter 16 because I want, I want to remind you of that they and that we. Acts chapter 16. What was number one, one more time? We were created for good company. Number two is this, an individual calling can only be fulfilled in a we context. An individual calling can only be fulfilled in a we context. I want you to see overwhelmingly that throughout the book of Acts, the terminology is they, 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 they. Then it becomes we, 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 we. You constantly see it in a group context. And I want you to notice on the page, we said earlier, just a few minutes ago, that, it, that Luke comes on without any kind of introduction, without any kind of fanfare. And I, I mean, it would have been fine. I mean, for crying out loud, um, Silas is mentioned and just... The chapter before in Acts 15, Timothy has just been mentioned in uh, Acts chapter I mean, 16, right where we are in our context. Others were mentioned. Barnabas is mentioned. Mark is mentioned. Why couldn't Luke have just written down on there that he himself had come along? Luke joined them at this point, and they just like, but instead, he's just like almost anonymous into this little word called we. And what I want to try to prove to you scripturally today is that that was meant to be all of us, that we would, we would realize that our calling can only be fulfilled. I don't care who you are. I don't care what God has called you to do. You cannot do it by yourself. You cannot fulfill God's destiny for you without good company. You have to be, because of the way he set up the system, you can't change it, and neither can I. Time will never change it, because the Word of God is established for all of eternity. And what he says is this, it's going to take group. 
And I can't fulfill my calling without a band of believers. They can't fulfill their calling without me. We come together as a body of believers. We have to be in a group context to ever fulfill our personal callings. Some of us are trying to do it. We think, okay, God has called me to write. I'm just going to, you know, I, this is, I've, I've been called to be all by myself. Let me tell you something. I know the loneliness of writing, and I have to put myself out there continually in a small group of people, and you have to too. None of us were called to fulfill our calling on our own. We're right there in that we context. I kept, I love plays on words and I kept seeing it over and over again in my mind. And here's what, I even stood in the mirror and did this. We don't have a we calling, but we have a we calling. Anybody get what I'm saying to you? We don't, and that helps me remember things. Okay, we, we don't have a we, I promise you, based on the authority of the Word of God, that yours is not a W-E-E, we little calling. But I promise you that it is a we calling. And, and I want to see you do that with me. I want everybody to say because I want them to see you right here. And if you're on the other side of that screen, I want you to do it too. In fact, you know what I'm going to do before we do it together? I want you to write down uh, some letters for me, please. Would you write down T-C-T-B-B? T-C-T-B-B. Those are my letters for too cool to be blessed. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Too cool to be blessed. Do you know of all the things that might block us from a mighty work of God, sometimes the biggest obstacle is that we're just too cool to get a word. Amen. We're just like too cool to engage. And sometimes like you just have to drop off all the, um, all the other uh, things that make us so aware. One of our praise team members prayed this morning that we would just lose our self-consciousness today. And I'm just like, get into it. The more you get into today, uh, the more you will be blessed. The more you answer back. If we do some little motions together, the more you do it. I don't care how stupid you feel, you'll have a breakthrough. Would somebody say they believe that to be true? Because if you're too cool to be blessed, listen, we can guard our dignity right out of an epiphany. I promise you that's the truth. We're just we're going to guard our dignity. We're going to be dignified in Bible study today, and we get out of that place. Other people that humble themselves and got totally into it got an epiphany, and we got nothing but our personal dignity. <laughs> I, want a, I want an epiphany today. Anybody else? I, I'm not just looking to have my dignity today. So here's what I want you to do. Everybody put your fingers up like I say. I don't have a we calling, but I do have a we calling. Put your arms around one another. I want to see it. We got a we calling. Are, you, are your arms around one another? Get your arms around one another. Okay. Yeah. We got a we calling. Now, I want to see it one more time. I don't have a we calling, but I do have a we calling. See? See how big your calling is when you get other people in it? Because your calling is as big as the group of people that you invest your life in. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Because you're trying to fulfill your calling on your own. You think it's just me and God. It's just me and God. You know what? Jesus called us into the context of company. We need it. We require it. Some of us are like, like we are turned inside out because we're missing it. Now, now, I'm about to tell you, I told you that Luke just fascinates me. And that God's just stirred up this fascination just here lately. And I'm going to tell you one of the reasons I'm so fascinated with me. Some, something about Luke that is, I think, rare, tremendously rare in our culture. He meticulously wrote two books. And we've already glanced in the two of them. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and he wrote the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostle, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, the Acts of Christ through his people, the Acts. Those two books Luke himself penned. Now, here's what I find astonishing. He so meticulously took pen to scroll and had the wherewithal and the humility to write the first really long one that did not have him in it. I want you to think this through with me. Because he was no part of what happened in the gospel of Luke. He was not there. He was not an eyewitness to it. He is a second generation Christian, which is why it's so profound to us that he wrote this book. Because he was not one of the original. He was nowhere in the book of Luke. 
But he wrote the book of Luke before he ever got to Acts. And if, you know, us and our narcissistic tendency, we would be like, I'm going to write the one I'm in. I'm going to write the one I'm in. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And like, I, I might have written the whole book that I was in and then gone back and thought, you know what? Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to write the prequel. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to write Luke. But instead, he wrote the one he wasn't in, not even knowing where it would lead. And he doesn't hop into the second one to the middle of the book. And I started thinking to myself, in this day and age when we are just fraught with self-absorption, and we're not, we're not that way by ourselves. I mean, we're born that way. That's part of our human nature. But our culture, everything about it screams that we would put ourselves first and think of ourselves first. And what I want to tell you, we got 180,000 women that are part of this today. What would happen if we gave up our self-absorbed approach to Scripture? Do you know how limited we will be in our Bible study if we only study the Scriptures that are going to say something to me? And if I get to the end of my pastor's sermon and because it, none of it spoke to me, I shut the Bible and walk to the car and go, you know what, that wasn't my favorite. You know what is always our favorite when our favorite's in it? I mean, is that fair to say? My favorite is when my favorite's in it and I am my favorite. You might know what I'm talking about because it's the truth, isn't it? It's our human nature. But, but what if we just loosed ourselves from that? God's Word has so much to say to us. But what if we stopped approaching it just to hear what he was going to say about me and just saw what he has to say, period? What if we opened our Bible and before we said, what do you have to say to me? Just what do you have to say, Lord? What do you have to say? Because I don't know about you, but in, in, in years of um, just, just um, trying to seek God, through the scriptures, and there's so little I know and so much I need to know, but I can tell you this, some of my biggest revelations, my biggest moments with him have been in passages where I didn't even know I would find myself. Something entirely about him, and suddenly I realize what that means to me and what impact that has over me. Is anybody there with me? Just that unexpected thing, I'm just going to study God's Word, and then I'm going to let him surprise me with what it has to say about me. And girlfriend, it's got a lot to say about you. It's got a lot to say. It's got everything to say to you. But, but what if we didn't just approach it to see what it was going to say to me? What if it was just, what do you want to say? What do you want to say? I want to take us into Bible class. If you and I were in a college, in a Bible college somewhere, and we were in a, um, a class to learn how to study, we would learn this word maybe at the very beginning of the semester, maybe by the middle of September, we will have already learned the word hermeneutic. Hermeneutic. I want um, them to bring it up on the screen, and I want you to write down this particular Definition, hermeneutic is a method or principle of interpretation. Hermeneutic. Everybody say the H word. Hermeneutic. And now tell me what it is. That means that when you and I go to the scriptures, and it certainly means that those who are commentators, those who are theologians, they have a hermeneutic. They have a way, a method by which they interpret the scriptures. Uh, my friend Kay Arthur has a very specific kind of approach. Her inductive Bible study method is a hermeneutic. Uh, my friend Ann Graham Lotz has a hermeneutic. She has a certain way that she approaches the study of scripture, how she interprets study. Now, what, what was that H word again? All right, now I want you to look at that word. Did you write it in your notes? All right, look down, and I want you to circle the word her, and then I want you to circle the word me. Now, gentlemen, this is going to be totally lost on you. Forgive us. Forgive us. But it wasn't a hermeneutic. It was a hermeneutic. I can't help it. I didn't come up with it. But here's what, 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 what two words did you circle? And what? All right, if my hermeneutic, if the her in my hermeneutic is me, Oh, girl, I'm going to miss the heart of the Scriptures. I'm going to miss the heart of the Scriptures. But if the hermeneutic is Jesus, 
The one who said at the very end of Luke's gospel that he himself, second generation um, Christian, was the one who pinned to the paper when he said that with those two people on the road to Emmaus after they had learned, after they had known that the G that Christ had been crucified and now his body was missing from the tomb. And they said, all hopeless, heads hanging down. We had hoped he was the one that was going to bring the redemption of Israel. And I want you to hear what Luke said and out of the words of Christ, red letter. It says this. It says that Christ said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Listen to verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. It says it started with Moses and the prophets. In other words, he split the five books of Moses and working all the way through the prophets. And Jesus just begins to show them all the way from Genesis to Malachi. It was about me. It was about me. If he is a hermeneutic, go back to that her that you I just circled. And now I want you to circle the H-E right at the very beginning of that word. Because there's your hermeneutic right there. There's your hermeneutic. I want Jesus out of my Bible study. I want Jesus Christ out of my Bible study. Here's what I want to get out of my Bible study. I want Jesus Christ. Anybody say that with me today? I want you, Jesus. I want you, Jesus. You go to your Bible study with that hermeneutic, and your life's going to be changed. And my life's going to be changed. He is my hermeneutic. I want that to be my approach. Down the street from the ministry, I am so blessed. I'm just going to say hello to him. I love him so much. My sweet staff, who has heard me more times than anyone in their entire lifetime would ever want to. Can you imagine hearing this twang over and over and over again? And yet on their Saturday off, they're gathered right there in front of the screen with all the volunteers, and I love them so, so much. And I sent y'all a text early this morning, and I hope you guys I got it. I just am so crazy about you. But they'll be able to testify that down the street from us, uh, we live on a road that comes right off this main highway that's called Luetta. And right on Luetta um, Drive um, in our area of Houston, Texas, to the north of the city, uh, we have a, a meatball diner. It's the strangest thing to me. Like, I mean, like, they opened up. We, we've gone there. Like, it's all manner of meatball. Like, you just order what kind of meatball you want. It's not like meatballs. It's what? A meatball. It's just like you get a meatball. You can get a meatball. All, you get a, a Texas meatball with jalapenos in it. You can, get all, you can get your traditional meatball. You just get every kind of meatball you can imagine. It's all, the whole thing is just what? Well, in order to really draw attention to this meatball diner that is down the street from the ministry, there is a man every day. This is a four-lane uh, road with a, with a median in between. And, and so there's two lanes going this way, two lanes going this way. And here's, here's the meatball diner right here. And this guy stands out almost every single time we go to lunch. He is out there in his meatball suit <laughs> almost every single time. And it's just like, I just always, I just feel so sorry for him. And in the very beginning, like he was, he was like a big round meatball, like a really stuffed meatball. And he, you know, would hold his sign and all. And we, I, 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 the first time we were driving down the street, I looked up and I said, y'all, is that a meatball? And it was, yes, it was a meatball. I mean, it's just like nothing you would expect. Like he went home from work and his wife said to him, how was your day? And he said, well, it was just, it was a meatball. Everything about its life is a meatball. And I've noticed it's hot in Houston. I mean, it's hot, hot in Houston. And I mean, he would be out there at 106 degrees as one big red meatball. And over the course of the last couple of weeks, his meatball just keeps keeping smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller. I, I, my, oh, my sisters would be able to tell you I'm telling you the truth. This last time we drove by just a few days before I came, and I said, y'all, he's a sun-dried tomato. This, nothing about him, nothing about him that even vaguely looks like a meatball. And I mean, he's just like, he no longer cares if we come to get a meatball or not. He doesn't care. And that's what happens when we have to be the big meatball. Is it just like after a while we just shrivel up and die? Because number one was what? We were created 
for some good company. And you better remind me what number two was. We have a we kind of calling. Our personal callings cannot be fulfilled without a we context. And that brings us then to our last one in this session together. And I love it because even though number two on our list is absolutely true for every single one of us, there is no exception. It is the way God set it up. Our gifts were meant to be used in the context of a body of believers. And without a body of believers, we cannot obey God. And we certainly cannot fulfill our destiny. So even though all of that is true, here comes the beauty of point number three. God never overlooks a single me in the bigger we. Never. God never overlooks a single me in the bigger we. I know somebody won't say amen to that. Would you repeat it back to me? I want to hear it from all of you, all the 180,000 of you out there. I want you to say it really loud where we can hear it here. Number three is what? I want you to practice something. I want you to say to your neighbor, I want you to look at somebody and say, God is not overlooking me. See, what would be so much easier is for you to look at them and go, God is not overlooking you. In fact, try that first. Go, God is not overlooking you. Now, now try this one. This is much harder. God is not overlooking me. Because he cannot overlook a single me in that much bigger we, and we are so happy to know that. Now, i got to show you something. Um, it is believed to be um, in uh, around the year 61 to 63 that, um, that Luke penned both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Now, I just want you to go here with me because he was in the company of Paul. In fact, are you still in Acts 16? And I'll show you something. Look at the very end of Acts 28. Look at the very end of the book of Acts. And we're coming back to it maybe in both the next sessions, but um, definitely the last one. Acts 28. Oh, we are coming to it next time too. All right, this will be the very last of, of Luke's writings. And, and it says in Luke 28, verse 30, for two whole years, Paul stayed there. And he's talking about in Rome. He had finally reached Rome. He was put under house arrest. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. I want to say to you, our, our dear sisters who are in the women's facility, I want you to know that God can do a whole lot with the person who is behind locked doors for a little while. I want you to see on the pages of Scripture, Paul did so much of his writing, so much of his ministry right there in that context. And you need to know it. You get your head up. God has not forgotten your me in the greater we of the body of Christ. But it says, how many years does it say? Two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to him. Well, during that two years, scholars believe that that's exactly when Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Now, I want you to just try to wrap your mind around this for a moment because just when we think we're just along for the ride, anybody going there with me? Just when we're thinking that we are this incidental, that there are other, there's like the big cheeses for Jesus, amen? And that they're like, they're out there doing the thing and the rest of us are just kind of like along for the run. Just when we think that we are somewhere anonymously lost in the whole uh, word called we, just when we think that God has something going for a whole lot of people, like my pastor, like my Bible study um, facilitator, uh, like the uh, heads of the mission groups and, and authors, he's got their thing going, but somehow I'm not in that. Just when we think we were along to support somebody else, 
God inspires a man named Luke who just came along to take care of Paul, the great apostle. And he sits him down in Rome, puts a pen in his hand. This is when you have to stay with me. And he writes more of the New Testament canon than any other writer in the page. I want somebody to get that with me because I've got the calculations right here. Um, Between his gospel and the book of Acts, he wrote the longest gospel by verses. Uh, You'll see that there's chapters that are longer um, in Um, in uh, some of the others, like in the Gospel of Matthew, more chapters, but not more verses. The chapters just come closer together. Luke has more verses in it than any other gospel. And between the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, there are 2,157 total verses to Paul's 2,032. Now, does anybody, y'all like numbers? You want to hear that again? Luke and, and Acts. 2,157 verses total, 2,157. Paul, 2,032. Now, you may go, now, Beth, it's really, it's not good to compare numbers. It's not good. No, it's not. It's not unless you might be a person who thought you were forgotten and only along for the ride. It just seems good to him to pick up the pen. And I, I want somebody in this next moment to please get a word with me because he says it just seemed good. I want you to look back at Luke chapter 1 and I want you to take this in for a moment. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down from those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. But since I myself had just carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it just, it seemed good. Do you know that the word doesn't mean um, he got a flash of lightning, that thunder rolled? Do you know that it means exactly what it looks like it means on on the pages of of Luke 1? It just meant, well, it just seemed good to me. Like there wasn't a big thing. A drum didn't roll like this. Um, when, When Luke was sitting there, God did not go, pick up thy pen and write. It just like seemed good to him. He talked to a lot of people, seemed good to him. And his pen went to paper. And God inspired more verses than anyone in the New Testament ever wrote. I'm going to ask the praise team to come, and I want to tell you guys something before we take our lunch break. I want you to understand that God doesn't always work in big splashes with lightning crashing. He doesn't always ride it across the wall. There's not always some big feeling attached to it when you're about to do the most important thing in your life. There's not always a lot of fanfare, not always this big inspiration. You don't always get chill bumps. The hair doesn't always stand up on the back of your neck. Sometimes it just like seemed good. And it'll be the biggest thing that God has ever called you to do. Your God has not lost you. Your God has not lost you. Your God has not lost you. Girlfriend, your God has not lost you. (laughs) Father, we want to hear from you. You come and you fall upon us. You, you, Lord, show us, show us that you see the me in this big we. And 180,000 people that you see, 180,000 ones and not just one corporate group. We need you. We need to know that you know we're here. We need your good company today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. This podcast is sponsored by Living Proof and Beth Moore.